and an increased frequency of chromosomal aberrations is recognized as an indication of an increased risk of cancer. As such, radiation-induced chromosomal aberrations are fundamental to the causal mechanism of radiation-induced cancer. It has been well documented that medium to high dose radiation increases chromosomal aberrations, but the influence of low dose radiation has been less certain. But if this mechanism of radiation induced cancer occurs at low doses, there would be little reason to doubt that low dose radiation can cause cancer. In 2010, Bhatti and colleagues published a meta-analysis of studies that examined the influence of medical x-ray examinations on the incidence of chromosomal translocations. They sought to gain greater precision on the impact of low-dose radiation by pooling data from multiple studies. Not only did they find a dose response in the low-dose range, but to their surprise, the frequency of chromosomal aberrations per unit of radiation increased below approximately 20 millisieverts. Moreover, at doses below approximately 10 millisieverts, the frequency of aberrations per unit of radiation increased further still, and by an order of magnitude. Given these findings, evidence for the carcinogenicity of radiation at low doses could hardly be more logically indicated. Let's examine this formally. The hypothetical syllogism is a two-premise argument schema of classical logic of the form. Given that, if it's the case that P, then Q, and if it's the case that Q, then R, then we may conclude that it's also the case that if P, then R, Plugging the scientific evidence we've just reviewed into the hypothetical syllogism, we may reason as follows. Given that, if there's low-dose radiation, then there's more chromosomal harm, and if there's more chromosomal harm, then there's more cancer, then we may conclude that if there's low-dose radiation, then there's more cancer. To some degree, this syllogism may be an oversimplification. However, our inputs in this valid argument schema are the outputs of state-of-the-art biological research. We've reviewed both established radiobiology and recent radiobiological research. From this broad scientific base, we've observed that the National Academy of Sciences predicts increased cancer risk from exposures below 20 millisieverts per year. Research published since the Academy's last report in 2006 corroborates that prediction. Recent research also suggests that the Academy's risk model may underestimate cancer risk. Recent research also finds that radiation exposures below 20 millisieverts are associated with genetic damage. Therefore, both historical and cutting-edge scientific research consistently demonstrate that Japan's allowance of 20 millisieverts per year is not safe. This is 5 O'Clock Shadow on the Pacifica Radio Network. I'm Robert Knight in New York, and we just heard a special radiological analysis by correspondent Ian Goddard, who presents further information at his own website, iangoddard.com. And finally, we bring this nuclear war back home with this recent presentation by nuclear epidemiologist Marco Kaltofen, who addressed the American Public Health Association. The audio was provided to Five O'Clock Shadow by our earlier heard colleague Arnie Gunderson, whom you will hear at the completion of this seminal analysis of Fukushima hot particles by Milto Kaltofen using a crowdsourced database of air filters addressing the previously unreported global hazards of Fukushima. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, my research work is on not so much radiation, but on the things that carry the radiation uh, to people. 
So what I have been studying has been what happens to dust after it becomes contaminated and how that dust carries radiation to the human body. Uh, I have to say that I have no personal financial relationships with commercial interests relevant to this presentation during the past 12 months. In doing this research, I have a few people I'd like to thank. In particular, I'd like to thank the volunteers of SafeCast. SafeCast is a group of both technical and non-technical volunteers in Japan who have been working since the March 11 earthquake, tsunami, and radiation release to try and document some of the radiation exposures people are experiencing in northern Japan. Uh, the central theme of my work is that the dust contaminated with fallout uh, follow from the Fukushima accidents is the source of human exposure to radiation. And you have probably, if you've seen some of the media coverage of radiation exposure in Japan, you've probably heard a lot of different ways that people have talked about how we're exposed to radiation and how it compares to our daily lives. And I'm actually going to ask for short hands. Am I allowed to do this? Sure. Has anyone heard the radiation in Japan being compared to, say, taking a flight from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C.? Okay. How about to eating a banana? Has anyone heard this one? Bananas have potassium. Potassium has a natural radioactive isotope. So we get a certain amount of, of low-level radiation from that exposure. The last question. Has anyone heard that a little bit of low-level radiation might actually be good for you? This is a, a hypothesis by uh, Dr. Ed Calabrese that a very small amount of radiation may actually cause what amounts to uh, something analogous to an immun immunological response. Sorry, I'm a civil engineer. I can't say those medical words. That response is actually a, a net positive at very, very low levels. So what we're talking about here is a slightly different kind of radiation where we're looking at a lot of concentrated radiation in a very small particle. So the total amount of radiation we're exposed to might in fact be low, but because we're exposing only a small number of tissues, for instance, for a respirable dust particle, uh, we inhale the dust particle, it's radioactive, it actually is about the same scale of size as a, as a cell in the human lung. And so that, that radioactive particle is um, adjacent to a cell. It's going to stay there because it has a long residence time. And so to that particular cell, that's not a very low dose. In fact, that's a high dose, potentially even a lethal dose to that cell. Although overall, it's a very low level of exposure to the entire human body. So let's look at some of the things that were released by the reactors at Fukushima. Uh, radioiodine, iodine-131. This is a short-lived gas, it tends to decay by about half every eight days. Cesium-134 and cesium-137, these have half-lives of about two years or 30 years, respectively. By the way, have people heard this term, half-lives? Talking about radioisotopes, thank you. Cobalt-60 has a half-life of about five years. A whole zoo of what are called fission wastes and neutron activation products. These are the materials that poison nuclear fuels over time when they're in the reactor. And then, of course, the original uranium and plutonium fuels that are in the reactor and other transuranics, uh, heavier than uranium isotopes like americium and neptunium, which are very specific to that uranium. And for how people are exposed to this radiation, there are several different vectors, several different ways these dusts will actually get into the human body. Uh, number one is going to be the inhalation of airborne particles. Uh, followed by the, the inhalation of resuspended dusts. The difference being, early on in the accidents, we had a lot of material emitted into the air. It's washed out by rain. It falls out as a settled dust. And then over time, the atmosphere clears, but sometimes those dusts, when they collect in a certain place, are going to resuspend, and the air will become contaminated again after a, a short downtime. People also ingest contaminated foods. Uh, the list I've put here, these are foods which have already been found to be contaminated with unacceptable levels of radiation. Uh, things like seaweed, 
shellfish, beef, milk, spinach, eggs, tea, fin fish. I should add mushrooms and uh, other things that are grown not just in the immediate area of the reactors, but sometimes as much as a couple hundred miles away. And if any of you are, are used to working uh, with juvenile health issues, and you're familiar with uh, contamination from lead paint and dusts in homes, uh, we also tend to, especially as children, ingest a good deal of soils and dusts. Uh, the EPA tells us that the average child is ingesting about a tenth of a gram of dust every day, I don't know about you, but I remember my kids when they were little, they say sometimes it might be as much as a gram or even a gram and a half of dust a day. That's an important way people are exposed to contaminated soils. And lastly, there's dermal contact, getting this material on the outside. <clears throat> so we tried to take a look at certain samples that would tell us a little bit about how dusts are moving through the environment in Japan. So we looked at automobile air filters. We tried this as a as a qualitative means of trying to capture a large number of radioactive particles so that we could learn about how those particles are in terms of their size, how they might dissolve in human body fluids, to capture enough particles that we could statistically analyze how they would behave in the environment and in the body. Uh, as it turns out, the way the average Japanese driver uses their car the amount of air consumed by a car in Japan is actually on the same order of magnitude as the amount of air that people use day to day. So a car versus a healthy worker will use anywhere between 10 to 30 cubic meters of air a day on average for the car obviously to burn the fuel. And to follow up on that, we also use a number of quantitative air filters. These are small metered filters running with air pumps that are taking an exact known amount of air and cutting off the specific particle size with a known amount. We can't get as many particles with this method, but we can use it to calibrate what the actual concentration is of hot particles in the atmosphere. We looked at home air filters for people's homes in Japan and in the U.S. We also looked at children's shoes. Children track in a lot of material on their shoes. Children play very hard in outdoor soils, and their shoes tend to pick up any contaminants that are in the soil. We also looked at settled dust in the home, surface soils, and foods and plants in Japan and the U.S. Our air sampling stations were set up at multiple locations. The first sampling station was the one I set up in Massachusetts about two hours after I learned of the reactor accidents because we look at the map and we can see we're at the same latitude as these reactors in Massachusetts. So that over time we're likely to see some of that material make its way in the atmosphere to us. We also set up uh, facilities in Seattle, San Francisco, Boulder, Hawaii, and the multiple facilities in Japan. Just two of them are here on the map. Uh, the primary radioisotopes we detected, the things we actually found in our dust samples, the cesium-134 and the cesium-137. Uh, iodine-131, which, uh, as you know, is a thyroid seeker, but with a short half-life. We only saw iodine-131 back in, in April. And even the samples we had in storage you can see the iodine slowly decaying on this. Cobalt-60, which is another activation product from uh, deep inside the reactor. The cobalt-60 is formed from steels in the reactor uh, that are exposed to radiation. So obviously somehow the steel at the center of the reactor must have um, come in contact with the atmosphere. And then other fission products as well. Uh, this is a quick map. I don't know if anyone has seen this before. This is a, a, a general map uh, taken by an aircraft over a Fukushima prefecture that shows uh, pretty much where most of the plume has gone. So if you'll notice, we have evacuation radii. We have a 20 kilometer uh, zone around which people have been evacuated from near the reactors. But in fact, because of the weather and the geography, you can see how most of this material has moved to the northwest. Uh, the permissible radiation dose, I'm not going to focus on this for very long, let me just say that the, the permissible radiation doses in Fukushima Prefecture were raised by a factor of 20. Um, there's obviously a lot more to this decision than I could ever get into in 15 minutes. Uh, our sampling team uh, experienced uh, a few difficulties in getting the materials they need. Probably the biggest one is in working with our <coughs> excuse me, volunteers, teaching them how to collect these samples safely get them safely and lawfully to the United States to be analyzed. 